In some ways, being a Christian in Ephesus was a little like being a crewman on the USS Dallas in the classic submarine movie, Hunt for Red October. A diverse group of individuals, you live life together, sailing in difficult and sometimes hostile waters. It's a demanding life, but you're all in. There's nowhere else to go. One day, a mysterious but authoritative man drops in from out of nowhere to stay a while and give you a new course, a new mission, a new way of thinking about things. Uh, You don't have much visibility ahead, but you continue on. And as you do, occasionally, after long periods of waiting, the dot matrix printer brings a message from topside. Here's what you need to know. Here's your new heading. Carry out your mission together. So the city of Ephesus at the time of uh, Acts 18, 19, and 20, and then the epistle to the Ephesians, it was centuries old, over a 1,000 years old. And it was one of those ancient cities that kept being uh, destroyed and burned. It also had a problem. It was a harbor city, uh, but the, the river that fed into it would silt up all the time. And so periodically, they would actually have to move the city over the centuries. In, in the format that we see it in the book of Acts, it was more than 400 years old, but Christianity had only been in town fewer than 10 years. We're between 60 and 62 AD. About five years earlier, the Apostle Paul left the city for the last time after founding and leading the church there for two or three years. The crucifixion itself had only happened about 30 years before, uh, at least before the Ephesians read their epistle. It was a harbor city, as I said. It's on the western coast of modern-day Turkey. It sat 600 miles from Jerusalem, more than 800 miles from Rome, 500 miles from Antioch. It boasted a population of 250,000 people, making it the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Its strategic location made Ephesus an ideal connector between east and west. Commerce flowed through these ports, bringing a variety of peoples and cultures, ideas, religions, philosophies, and wealth. In the first century, the city constructed a marble road that led from the great theater where the biblical riot took place to the great temple of Artemis. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple, not the marble road. This temple was four times the size of the Greek Parthenon. It made it the largest structure on earth at the time. Uh, They used to call it the marble city. The temple was all made of marble, marble all over the place. In fact, Ephesus was one of the world's first tourist destinations and boasted many luxuries at the time. The city streets were lit by oil lamps at night. The homes of the wealthy even featured running water and plumbing for their private bathrooms. Now, if you didn't live in the Bel Air section of town, if you weren't rich enough for your own bathroom in your own house... Well, you could use the fancy and newly constructed public bathroom, which had its own plumbing system with running water. You can still visit this bathroom today, and I'm told even sit on one of the seats, though they ask you not to use it. So, I wish we could spend a lot of time on this bathroom. Big square, uh, the one section that you can see has 36 seats. No dividers, just, just big long rows in a square, hole, 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 hole. But people would spend like lots of time there doing their business and conducting business and waiting for uh, invitations to dinner and things like that. For cleanliness, for cleanliness, they would have a bucket full of vinegar and a sponge on the end of a stick. There wasn't toilet paper back then, but they needed to be as hygienic as possible. And in my research, I also discovered that archaeologists have excavated some of the ancient excrement and a bunch, and they just like, there's all kinds of hookworm. Like everybody was just passing all of these parasites all the time. That's the end of my toilet research. But I'm going to say this, wait, wait, that's the end of my toilet research, but I am holding on to such a great toilet in Ephesus nugget for later in the book. I can't wait. I can't wait till we get to this passage later on. And it, it blew my mind 
and it's going to blow your mind, I hope. The city of Ephesus was full of wealth and wonders and amenities, but we also know it was full of paganism, racism, demonic activity, classism, unrest. Walking from home to work, you would pass by brothels, occult shops, fortune tellers, demon-possessed people, and exorcists doing their best to help them. Five or 10% of the city's population was Jewish, and a few of those Jews had left the synagogue and formed a new community called a church. They followed the way, and some Gentiles had joined up too. In fact, over the last five or seven years, more Gentiles had been born again and were now Christian instead of worshipers of Diana or the emperor cult or one of the hero cults in town. But what did it really mean to be a Christian in Ephesus? To come out of one of the Gentile religions uh, would mean you were turning away from so much of what defined your life, the style of worship, the accepted morality, the habits, the pastimes, the social calendars, the circles you ran in. It was all gone. And this was a whole new life, a whole new mentality, a whole new everything. Uh, from the top down. But what new would be replacing the old? We can't imagine a world without Christianity, right? We can't. We've never known anything close to a world that wasn't uh, founded on Judeo-Christian principles. The whole, you know, the whole of Western civilization is at least uh, built upon certain Judeo-Christian principles, and the Bible has been the best-selling book since 1522, But in first century Ephesus, there is no New Testament. The Jews in town would be familiar with the Hebrew Bible, but it's not like Gentiles would have a copy in their homes. In fact, the believers in Ephesus hadn't even known about the existence of the Holy Spirit until Paul came and explained it to them just a few years before. So not only are you switching religions, you are are, are effectively to the eyes of the people around you and probably to yourself, you're switching religions, I'm going to use that word in the general sense, to a new religion. Where, where the person who is explaining this new way of living was saying, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm introducing you to a brand new God you've never heard of. Where are his books? Yeah, there's not really any books I can give you. Oh, wh- what's the material where I can learn about him? Well, you're going to learn about him from me. Wait, well, you seem to be holding a bunch of bags. Yeah, I'm leaving. It'll be okay. The Holy Spirit's with you. The who? Well, yeah, I should tell you about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's incredible to think about what the believers of Ephesus would have and wouldn't have known about as believers. There are no Christian schools or publishing houses at the time. There are no weekend seminars or retreats. There are certainly no podcasts or anything like that. Most of the Christians around you have only been saved for a couple of years as well. Paul got the church started and on a great track for sure, but he's been gone for five years And many of the Gentile church members in the city had never met him, never spoke to him, never heard him speak. In fact, they only knew the apostles' doctrine secondhand. What did you say he told you? Well, at one time I was in the hall of Tyrannus and and I asked him this question and and here's what he said. When was this? Five years ago. Do you remember all the conversations you had with people five years ago? I certainly don't. Meanwhile, as an Ephesian, you are inundated with philosophies and religions and claims about what is true and what the meaning of life is and what morality is and right and wrong. There's Epicureans over here and these cult members over there and sorcerers on every street corner. On top of that, there were powerful groups within your city who were convinced that it was the Christians who were ruining the economy and destroying the fabric of society. Most of you watch the news, and you know if you watch the news, they're talking about recession and inflation and all of that. Has anybody, I don't watch the news, has anybody on any of those news channels said, what do you think are main factors in the economic recession right now? It's the Christians that are doing all of it. They're destroying our society. They're destroying our culture. They're ruining our economy. You know, quite honestly, you don't, as an Ephesian believer, didn't know that much about what it means to be a Christian. Not in 60 AD. Now, you know that you were blind and now you see. You know that you were a slave to sin and now you're free in Christ. You know that the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in your heart and you are a new person. But beyond that, you're going to have a lot of questions. And it would have been hard to not feel like you were in a submarine at the bottom of the Pacific. 
uh, not to feel incredibly isolated or wonder, okay, what is the Christian life supposed to be? What are we supposed to do? There was so much to have to figure out and navigate with comparatively so little to go on. Into that setting, Paul sent his letter to the Ephesians. And we'll see that it is particularly directed to those Gentile Christians who he did not know. Paul knew a lot of the Christians in Ephesus. He spent three years there doing ministry with them every single day, undoubtedly had many close friends there. But this letter is primarily targeted towards Gentile Christians who are new to the faith. And there's lots of good evidence that it wasn't just for them in that city, but it was meant to be read cyclically in a bunch of churches throughout the region. Now, the letter Paul sent was a doozy. I mean, it, we can take any book of the Bible and talk it up and, and just be really excited about it. It's the Bible. It's God's wonderful revelation uh, to mankind. Uh, but, but even among the books of the Bible, uh, the book of Ephesians is just a, an incredible book. Here's how scholars describe it. Pound for pound, Ephesians may be the most influential document ever written. It's called the crown and climax of Pauline theology, the sublimest communication ever made to men. Now, at the same time, we also discover that it is the most general epistle ever written by Paul. It has no personal greetings. In a lot of his books, he'll say, hey, say hi to my friend here or there or the, you know, this person or that person. It doesn't have any of those. It speaks to no locally specific problems like many of his letters did. We think of Corinth. He speaks about locally specific problems that group of Christians was dealing with. Or Thessalonica. He speaks to specific questions and problems that they had or Galatia. But, but Ephesians is very general. And the fact that Ephesians is so general of a letter to a general audience shouldn't make us focus less on the book. In fact, the opposite is true. If we think about it, as Christians now living in 21st century America, a more sort of what they call general letter maybe has even more to say to us. Because listen, when we're reading the letter to the Corinthians... Let's be honest, we don't really personally identify with some of the problems that they had, right? Some of the incredible sin issues they were dealing with, where the church was openly celebrating an incestuous relationship, we don't really identify with that problem. When we're reading Paul's letter to the Galatians, I mean, we listen to the principles about not drifting into legalism as we should, and and there's so much application there. I'm not making light of that or less of that at all, but as a church, we're not really in danger of abandoning evangelical Christianity for Jewish legalism, right? That's that's not really going to hit home in the same way, but Ephesians speaks to us from start to finish about base-level Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian? Not just in Ephesus, but a Christian period in any place, in any time. What is the Christian life about? Whether you're Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, ancient or modern, young or old, this is Christianity. It's direct and it's specific and it's definitive. Of course, a book this important is going to be dogged by controversy, Starting in the late 1800s, there have been some who suggest that Ephesians wasn't written by Paul and it wasn't written to the Ephesians. Great. Thank you for your help. (laughs) They say it was someone else using Paul's name, maybe someone who just really cared about Paul a whole lot, one of his disciples. If you read commentaries or, or, you know, like blogs about Ephesians, you're going to come across this argument as if it's a legitimate argument. We can dispatch this idea very quickly. Uh, mostly because the text says it's from Paul. And so you either believe that the holy scriptures that you have in your hand are inerrant and, and infallible and reliable and authoritative, or you don't. And if you say, well, I don't really believe that the word of God is inerrant, well, I would love to hear how you know which parts are uh, inerrant and which parts are not inerrant and which parts therefore are authoritative and what is not authoritative. And if the author is lying about who he is, how do you know he's not lying about who Christ is? But even so, the text says it's from Paul. It's the first word of the letter. 
Uh, but even beyond that, there were writings that circulated in this time claiming to be written by apostles, but were in fact forgeries. I mean, and you've probably heard of, you know, some of these, we, you know, you hear about like the gospel of Judas or some of these other books. There's a lot of writings and books like that, that were not written by the people that they claimed to have written them. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, some of these scholars will say, well, in the ancient culture, they didn't see that as a problem. Yeah, yeah, they did. Paul did not condone that practice. The early church rejected pseudepigraphal documents. It means using a fake name. Uh, they rejected them. The witness of the early church for Ephesians being a letter from Paul is extensive. That's a quote from one excellent scholar. And so we don't need to worry that the book is lying to us about the, who the author is. And if you're interested in just a really detailed explanation of, of this particular argument, there's a couple of, of great commentaries uh, that you can look at. One of them is by a guy named Daryl Bach in his commentary in Ephesians. He goes through all of that stuff in detail. But verse 1 of chapter 1 opens this way. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Paul wrote this letter while imprisoned and in chains. He was locked up a lot, so we can't be sure which imprisonment it was. The clues all seem to indicate that it was during his first Roman imprisonment when he was under house arrest for two years. He opens the letter speaking not as the guy who founded their church or the spiritual father of the people who got saved in the city or even as, hey, it's your old friend. He, he says, I am a specially chosen messenger from God himself. That's what the term apostle means, by the way, a messenger sent on a mission. He, he was uh, specifically called out to be an apostle in, in the sense that we would say the big A, apostle. Uh, there aren't big A apostles today in the church uh, because they, to, to qualify to be a big A apostle in the church in the New Testament, you had to have had uh, communication with the risen Christ and no one fits that bill today. But he is going to explain in that the church universal is being built upon the foundation of the apostles' teaching and that they had been specially commissioned by Jesus Christ to do this work. And so right from the beginning, he's saying, hey, listen, I am here to speak for God because God is doing a special work and he's selected me among a few other guys to lay the foundation of this church that is going to be built. God's will for Paul was for him to reveal the plan for the church. What Paul would explain would be mind-blowing, world-changing, some of it mysterious, some of it demanding, some of it downright radical. But this is the plan that the Lord has had all along. Paul makes that very clear in this letter. And this is the plan all along. And God has been working this out from before the foundation of the cosmos. God has been accomplishing his plan. And Paul was going to explain to the Ephesians and to us what it means for us and what our part to play in that plan is as Christians. And that God's will is that we discover it and that we join with him in it. Verse 1 continues, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. There are those who say the letter was not really to the Ephesians. Why? It's because in three very old manuscripts, they do not contain the words at Ephesus in verse 1. Okay, that is true. They don't. Uh, but even those manuscripts have superscriptions above the text identifying the letter as to the Ephesians. So you have to understand all of the, you know, you'll, because if you come across these kind of arguments, at first you're like, oh my gosh, is, uh, is Paul's letter to the Ephesians not by Paul and not to the Ephesians? Look at these people with all these letters after their names that say that, you know, oh, we don't, it's not from Paul. And so if you think it's from Paul, you're some kind of simpleton. And the fact of the matter is, there are a bunch of people in throughout, particularly modern history, who sat around with the goal of dismantling what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who suggests Paul didn't write Ephesians is not a believer or is not faithful to, you know, the Lord or anything like that, but, but these problems are not actually problems, and, and these accusations that are made don't have merit just because a person who is an academic makes them. Does that make sense? And so uh, don't get tripped up by that stuff. You can trust the Bible that you have in your hand. Uh, 
all day, every day. So Paul calls them faithful saints here. For me, terms like these are pretty easy to run by as I read, but let's pause on them for a moment. In the Bible, every Christian is a saint. Now, we don't really use that word today because it's one of those words that has been taken hostage by a different group, right? Uh, saints mean something else. When, when we immediately think of that word, it, it means something else. One commentator said this, saints, as a term, has been restricted for centuries to men whose holiness has been of a very technical and very artificial type, right? I, I like that. I mean, and, and, and it's true in many ways. The term saints just means holy ones. And you're not holy because of the religious things you do. See, that's, that's where this term has been taken hostage. That, uh, oh, a person who is a saint does particularly holy things, magnificently difficult and holy things, and therefore they are a saint. But that's not how the Bible uses this term. You're not holy because of religious things you do. You're holy because of God's work in your life. To be holy means you are separated It means you are given a special spiritual purpose in life, and it means that you are clean. That's holiness, and that's the ongoing work of sanctification in a Christian life, in every Christian life. God says, yeah, I'm doing that in every one of my people's lives, not just a couple of, you know, people who do weird stuff and wear weird clothes and live in weird places. He says, no, every Christian is being sanctified. That's what it means to be a Christian, that I'm doing this work in your life, that I'm making you a new creation. You are separated. You're given a special spiritual purpose. You're made clean. We are continually separated from the pursuits and the ruin of the world around us. We are given a spiritual purpose, much of which is described in this letter. And then we are continually made clean by the blood of the lamb and the washing of the water of the word. That's what it means to be a saint. And so if you're a Christian, that's you. You're a saint. You're a holy one. Paul also calls them faithful. Does that mean that I'm full of faith or that I have fidelity toward God? Yes. It means to be a person who is exercising your faith. And so for the Ephesians, it means the Ephesians believed in what they believed in. As Christians, we believe in a lot of things, but we we always want to pause and say, do I really believe in the things that I believe in? The things that I affirm intellectually about who God is and his plan for this world, his plan for my life, his calling on my life, do I believe in them enough to live according to those beliefs? The Ephesians, he says, man, you guys are holy saints. You believe in what you believe in. What do they believe? Well, Paul hadn't revealed a whole lot of things to this group, but what they believed is that God revealed himself through Jesus Christ who came and lived and died and rose again so that men could be saved from their sin and given everlasting life. They believed that the present age may end very soon and so we should be prepared for it. They believed that the world around them was something to separate from and to save others out of. They believed the Christian life was to be lived on purpose in the power of the Spirit. One source describes the faithful sainthood during the first century this way. He says, Christians stood out for their chastity, their hatred of cruelty, their civil obedience, good citizenship, and payment of taxes despite the severe suspicion they incurred on this count because they refused to perform the customary civil formality of praying to the emperor and the state gods. They did not expose infants. They did not swear. They refused to have anything to do with idolatry and its byproducts. Faithful saints. Such a simple descriptor, but incredibly important. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, we find ourselves confronted here by what the New Testament teaches is the basic irreducible minimum of what constitutes a Christian, faithful saints, holy people exercising their faith, exercising their beliefs. Of course, the Ephesians weren't perfect. We know that. Of all of the the churches in the book of Acts and certainly in the book of the Revelation, the church in Ephesus is one that we know sort of the most about, at least different points in their history, that Paul was their pastor, that Timothy was their pastor. We know from, from the church fathers that John was their pastor. Of all the churches in the book of the Revelation that Jesus writes a letter to, Ephesians is the only one even mentioned in Acts. And so we know a little bit about them, and we know that they weren't perfect. They would struggle. They would misstep. They would need adjustment and correction and revelation. But they were faithful saints. 
Of course, it's obvious that they, as they were reading Ephesians, couldn't say, well, we're saved, so we know everything we need to know, and so now we can just ride out life until we get to heaven. The whole point of this letter is that Paul needed to explain truth to them so that he could deepen their understanding. They needed this epistle. Paul says, man, you need to know this stuff. And so, of course, so do we. We can't ever sit back as Christians and say, I know what I believe, I know everything I need to know, and so now I can coast and just kind of live my way through life and you know, I'll get to heaven. And, 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 and Ephesians is presenting like, no, you, you and I need to understand what it means to be a Christian. Because being a Christian means you have a cosmic place in the cosmic plan of God that he has been working out and is continuing to work out. And you need to know these things because to be a Christian means to be a faithful saint, a a, a saint, a person who's given a spiritual purpose and who's continually being made clean and separated from the world and faithful, that you believe in what you believe and that you're exercising your faith. Lloyd-Jones continues, this is not a letter addressed to some unusual or exceptional Christian people. It's not a letter addressed to so-called scholars. It's not a letter to specialists, but a letter to ordinary church members. It is an epistle that is addressed to people like ourselves. Verse 2 says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what was God offering here at the beginning? The religions and the philosophies of the culture around them offered all sorts of things. Some of them outlandish and crazy and super weird. Some of them uh, very palatable to the ancient mind or even the modern mind. The the philosophies, the religions, the cults, the isms around them offered earthly pleasures or the promise of bumper crops or fertility, things like that. Position in the empire, power of one kind or another. What did the Lord offer his people? Grace and peace. Of course, what God was extending is going to be detailed in much greater fantastic depth in the coming verses and chapters, but overall it was his grace and his peace. Scholars point out that Paul Christianized the versions of the Greek salutation and the Hebrew salutation here, and he brought them together. And it's very fitting because one of the great themes of Ephesians is going to be the unity of the church. We have to understand that, man, Jews and Gentiles... They didn't really hang together, run together, live life together, and now suddenly you have this new thing, the church. The Jews came out of the synagogue, the Gentiles came out of their pagan temples, and here they are together and trying to figure out, how's how's this going to work? We don't usually live in this sort of way, and Paul's going to explain in in wonderful ways how this church was going to come together, all of these parts together as a unified whole, how God was going to bring together all peoples, Jews and Gentiles, into one growing unit. Unity was so important for this young church, for all the young churches of uh, the book of Acts, right, of the New Testament. Disunity was a major hurdle and problem, particularly in the church at Jerusalem. And so it's a, it's a huge, important thing for this young church, but of course it still is. We should try to think about what it would have been like to be a Christian in Ephesus, and because we live in a time where it's just so very easy to be completely disconnected from the church and still feel like you're doing all of the things that a Christian should be doing according to the callings of Scripture, right? Right? This is the big debate now that we're sort of through COVID and shutdowns and all of that. All of these, you see all of these articles and things like that about online attendance, offline attendance, uh, you know, these sorts of things. And there's this big cultural debate even before COVID of, hey, do do I really need to go and be a part of a local church? I am the church. And so I can just kind of float around and be the church whenever and whenever, wherever I want. But man, an Ephesian Christian, They didn't think anything like that. In some ways, we're not really that worried about unity with believers because there isn't such a difference between Christian culture and the world culture around us, right? We're able to have lots of connections to lots of different peoples and groups, and there's really not that big of a difference, Part of that is because so much of the world has been Christianized, but it's not that the world is Christian around us. It's not that people are following the Lord or following His Word in the wider culture around us. But man, the Ephesians, 
They were like, yeah, I, I, don't, I can't go to that temple anymore. I can't be a part of that guild anymore. My family has disowned me. I can't go to that social event or that place of business or do this feast or that thing. We all have to come together as the church and be a family together and build into one another's lives. Otherwise, man, what's going to happen? Church community was so essential and so crucial that these Christians in a city like Ephesus would carve symbols into the rock on the ground as a sign to other Christians who might be looking for them one day. You've heard of the, the ichthus, right? Or you've heard the stories about the Jesus fish. We've all heard that. You know that Christians, especially in times of persecution, one of them would draw half the fish and the other one would draw half, the rest of half the fish and you would know, okay, we're Christians, we're brothers, and you would have that unity and you would have that community. In, in, in Ephesus, it's cool. You can see them today. They have some all over the place carved into the rock what's called the ichthus wheel. And it was a circle with eight spokes because you can, you can spell I-X-O-Y-E in all, using a circle with eight spokes. And the ichthus, that's that term, I-X-O-Y-E. I don't know the Greek names of the letters, but it was an acronym that stood for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. And so they would carve this into, into the rock so that others would know where a, a church might be found. It, you can, like I said, you can still see these on the streets of Ephesus. I, I don't know what sort of vandalism laws were on the books at the time. <laughs> but imagine church fellowship and unity and community being so important that you would carry a hammer and a chisel with you. And when you would go out into public, you might sometimes carve a special symbol into the concrete just in case a Christian you've never met came down the street and saw it and said, oh, there's a church nearby. I can find my brother and we can commune together. Have you ever spray painted directions to our church on, the, on, on a city street somewhere? Don't do that, but... But that's what they're doing there with a hammer and chisel. This is crazy. Now, the Lord is going to show us so much through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's not just about unity, although that is a major theme, but also it's about God's great desire that you and I be filled full, filled full of the Spirit, full of strength, full of understanding, full of purpose, full of hope and the riches of God's glory, filled with all the fullness of God, Paul will say. This has been God's plan and desire all along. And his hope is that we would walk with him in faith and obedience. Along all the days of our lives, God's plan is to build us as individuals and as families of faith and as a local church so that we, as part of the church universal, can continue the work that he began and has planned since before the foundation of the earth. His plan all along is to do this dramatic work in and through our lives so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine that? You and me on display as the great example of the magnificently rich grace of God. Some of you have been to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Think about what's on display there, the, the exhibits you want to see. God says he wants to put you on display for all eternity to demonstrate the immeasurable richness of his grace and kindness. The props from the movie Red October are not in the Smithsonian, as far as I know. You know what is there? The Apollo 11 command module. Why? Because we want to see the ship that made it to the moon. Because we want to see the real thing. That's worthy of exhibit. Because you can stand before that and marvel at the achievement of what was done through that vehicle, right? Ephesians explains that the marvelous mission and blessing of Christianity is working itself out through your life and through my life, through our Christian fellowship. But this incredible plan is demanding. One commentator writes this, this letter requires us to change our inner being and character in a radical way. Life can no longer merely happen for all our activity must now take place in, to, and for the Lord. Daryl Bach writes, this letter serves as an exhortation to the church about what salvation is and what to do with that salvation as a result. It examines where the church as a community should be headed with the crucial reminder that God in his grace has already given us all we need to get there. 
So along the way, we'll see that God's truth directly challenges the philosophical systems of the world around us. It was Christ on the throne, not Caesar. Yahweh is Father and God, not Artemis, who is called the Queen of Heaven and described as the Lady Lord and Savior. Ephesus was proud to have been designed according to the principles of the great Greek urban planner, Hippodamus. I always want to call him Hippopotamus. That would be awesome. But Paul would explain to them how a life, a home, a church, a society is built based not off of Greek urban planning principles, but off of the principles of Christ's love and truth. While the civic leaders of Ephesus kept rebuilding and beautifying the great temple of Diana, Paul would explain that, no, no, you are the temple of God's Holy Spirit, and he is building you. While pagans downtown worshiped in the hero cult, this letter would reveal that to the Ephesian Christians and to us, that they were the heroes. He says, man, you're going to put on the armor of God because you are now the body of the Lord and you're going to join in the triumphant fight against the powers of evil. That's the plan. This and much more. It's always been the plan. So the question is, are we ready to hear what God's plan is and then accept it for our own lives? Are we on his course Are we clinging to some city concern or have we stepped into the cosmic inheritance God has prepared for us? We are Christian, which means we are going somewhere and we're meant to go together. This book is gonna help lead the way in every age, through every circumstance, around every turn. And I'm excited about that. Let's pray.